Today on Building the Open Metaverse. How do you express science and engineering in a way that touches people's heart? And we know that people don't remember what you say, but they remember how you make them feel. How can we make something technical feelable? Welcome to Building the Open Metaverse, where technology experts discuss how the community is building the open metaverse together. Hosted by Patrick Cozy from Cesium and Mark Petit from Epic Games. Hello, I'm Mark Petit from Epic Games, and my co-host is Patrick Cozy from Cesium. Hi, Patrick. How are you today? Hey, Mark. I'm doing great. I was in San Francisco last week. I was at the Masters of Scale Summit, so I was telling lots of people I met about our podcast. Uh, and I did tell one person, I go, you know, but I don't think I'm a very good podcast host personality. And they made me feel better. They said, well, it takes about five years to become a good host. Uh, so I felt, felt better about that. But enough about me. We have a really incredible guest today. Yes. And we're super excited uh, to welcome to our show someone who's an innovator, an entrepreneur, and an artist. And that person is Ping Fu. Ping, you're a veteran of the tech and art community. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Mark. Good meeting you, Patrick. So you are the CEO and co-founder of GeoMagic, uh, which was acquired uh, by 3D System. And you're currently on the board of a number of interesting projects like Nation, Burning Man, and you've been a very, very long time contributor to the 3D graphics community. So we're super happy to have you with us today. Yeah, I feel quite old. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, that was not the intent. <laughs> <laughs> so Ping, we love to start off the podcast and ask our guests about their journey to the metaverse. I mean, for you, you grew up in the Cultural Revolution in China. Uh, that helps you become a, a maker. And then you came to the U.S. and you studied computer science. I mean, tell us about your, your journey. Yeah, so I didn't have the normal education when I was in China because the Cultural Revolution is uh, 10 years, which is from, for me, it's from 8 to 18. So I basically missed out the K-12 normal academic education I uh, learned from doing. So if people say straight smart, and that's who I am. Uh, Mao sent us out to learn from the workers, farmers, and soldiers. So I worked in the factory, I worked in the countryside, and I been trained by the military for marching and shooting. So that's uh, my background. And then I studied Chinese literature when I was in China because I didn't really have choice of what major um, that I can study. I wanted to be an uh, astronaut because my father was a professor at Aeronautic Aerospace Engineering University. There's two of them in China. And, but I was sent to study literature and somewhat got in trouble during that time. And that's what prepared me to come to the United States. Um, when I came to the United States, I originally wanted to study literature, but my English was so poor, so I couldn't study literature. So I asked around, like, what can I study? And someone, I don't even remember who it is, and said, you should try computer science. That was in 1984, and computer science was at its very beginning. Um, I said, what is that? And they said, well, you know, instead of writing essays for people to read, you're writing code for people to use. And I thought, great, um, I'm going to study a man-made language, so I'm going to be on the same platform as everybody else, not have to worry about my English. And I'm a maker by my upbringing, so this seemed like a good, uh, good choice. That's how I got into computer science. So you, you were, um, so you said you mentioned 1984, and you studied as a program manager and became director of visualization at the NCSA, where you were working with Mark Andreessen and on, on Mosaic. So at the time, did you have the sense of how important and impactful web browsing would become? Uh, no, because I was at the time managing the visualization uh, software development. I had an SF grant. And Mark Andreessen came in as a sophomore undergraduate student, actually in my group there are all European PhDs. And he was just at IBM and doing use, uh, graphic user interface. At the time, that's really new. Uh, when he came in, he said, you know, I don't really want to work on all this super deep mathematic project. 
can I work on a different project? And I said, what do you want to do? He said, I want to do something with graph- graphic user interface. And that's how really Mosaic came about because I was managing also all of the public domain software, you know, the, the beginning of open source. And I was really tired of like typing the domain, um, typing the FTP number. <laughs> Remember back then you do 1.9.1.2.62.61 all the time. And then it's also like you always have to explain what they download. So writing a browser such that we can leverage the FTP, the domain name, which also just came on uh, the scene and his graphic user interface was a perfect combination. So that was the project he took, but he took it much further than I saw it. And he and Eric Bina and a few other students just got really excited about graphic user interface. And that's the beginning of browser. And Mark did invent the inline imaging mm-hmm. because back then we are not the first browser, but most of them are just text-based. And I suggested the view source. If you remember in the early days, the, um, there's a view source um, button um, so people can look at the samples and just put their tags in. And so those two were really what made the browser popular. And when Mosaic was first released, HTML was not a standard technically. Was that an easy decision to go for HTML? Were there alternatives? Yeah, we actually originally approached Gopher. Um, but Gopher was not open source and they won't refuse to give us a source code. And then university also wanted to charge us a fee. So HTML was the alternative, which is open source, free, and also very simple. When we looked at it back then, when uh, Tim Berners-Lee had it, it's 5,000 lines of code. So it was super easy for us to adopt. And that was the reason we chose it. It's easy, it's open, and it's free. Well, the reason I ask is to some extent, you know, we're, with the metaverse, we're back in a pretty similar situation. We yeah. have independent proprietary platforms like Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft, Meta Horizon, Decentraland. And everybody's like, well, well geez, would, you know, wouldn't it be easier to access each and every one of them by browsing from one to the next? So how would you start if you were to build a new generation of browser for real time pretty well? What's in hindsight, you know, what would you be your words of wisdom for us? Well, I would say like a standard is a very difficult and tedious work that's often behind the scene that people don't appreciate. And 3D is adding next level of complications. Um, Even if we look at the 2D at the beginning, remember the days that we have all this 2D imaging format and you convert uh, TIFF to to target, to, to raw bitmap, and even this day, I still sometimes convert them, but there's software to convert them. Um, with the metaverse, I think it's it's 80-20 rule. The standard make covers 80% of what people want, and 20%, it's always going to be outliers, just because the complication of 3D is so much higher than, than 2D, right? Um, the, the way I think of standard is even the word is interesting because the minute you put a standard as a word out there, people start to think about average. I think of software people are just like artists and they don't want it to be average. So, so as a result that they typically don't um, look for standard or respect standard or comply to standards. Even though everybody know interoperability is very important, uh, standard creates efficiency, yada, yada, right? Um, so one of the way I like to think about it is to think about it as a principle rather than standards. And I remember Brian at Autodesk, when he was giving a talk, he said, two set changes mindset, mindset changes behavior, behavior changes the society, right? So I think the principle is what changes mindset and standard feels more like a ruse and people want to break rules. So I think a language matters. Back then when we did the internet, the first version of internet, we chose World Wide Web because it sounds good. Um, And then if you look at it, uh, back then there was 
uh, online service, right? The, the Web One online service is very important for consumer to get online. Remember American Online? It was、mm-hmm. so、uh, simple for normal people to understand that they even they just short of dropping napkins with American <laughs> Online on it. And I remember my brother-in-law was super conservative, and his older generation he would get so excited he would go like American Online. Uh, I'm getting online, so、mm-hmm. I think a language is important in the sense of how do you get people to adopt to something that seemingly aligns to their value, and that's why principle sometimes works better than rules. In the situation that's very complex. Yeah, it's an interesting、uh, terminology perspective.、Uh, so, so Ping, I, I want to thank you on behalf of probably. Tens of millions of developers for View Source, and very very handy.、Um, and then you know, very cool to hear the history there of of doing inline images and going from text only to images. Because you know, one way we look at the metaverse is now that next media type, right? Immersive, immersive three D.、Um, so our podcast here, Mark and I actually started it、um, as a SIGGRAPH Birds of a Feather session about a year and a half ago with the same name, Building Open Metaverse, and we invited lots of Technology leaders to come speak, and what we saw was everyone was talking about the need for interoperability. You know, call it standards or, or, or principles,、uh, but just the underlying concept to you know to allow many different participants participants to build together、uh, in the metaverse.、Uh, and then this last year at SIGGRAPH, we did a full day course on this,、um, and one thing that we saw a lot of was the the talk about、uh, USD, Universal Scene Description. Uh, which was originally from Pixar, and now Nvidia is doing a lot of work on this、uh, this 3D format that you know could become the the 3D open standard for for the metaverse.、Um, mm-hmm. So so now the the metaverse standards forum has been stood up. It's about 1,700 companies at this point、uh, to enable stakeholders to engage to to share requirements and discussion around around open standards. And we were curious if you had any advice, you know, for us. Or for the the group as a whole, the forum as a whole. I wouldn't say I have、um, great advice、um, because I have not really worked on the standards.、Um, the thing that I have done in the past more is on the open source software. So when when when、uh, Mosaic become a runaway success,、um, become Netscape, and some of The developer in our group left, and which left HTTP server、um, in a in a bad situation. And that's when a couple of developer got together and took over the HTTPD, the server side of the software, and then started Apache、um, software. And initially, Apache was just、uh, a group of people really. Wanted to con-、uh, continue the internet、uh, decentralization and maintain the openness. It, it was very similar to the today's metaverse and the Web three、um, rhetoric, right? It's the same alignment of the value, and they started to to do the、um, Apache, and I actually got IBM to be the early sponsor of Apache because. I was man. I was managing the FTP on、uh, the public domain software, so I was very interested in that. And I also worked at Bell Lab before I went to NCSA, where I saw how AT and T tried to control the digital format and scrambled half the bit、um, for the TV and then、uh, ISDN and end up fail、uh, because it the whole world was not connected. So from that failure, I really. Felt the、um, the consistency of open source is very important. So I think、um, the metaverse and same as the cryptos can learn a lot from the open source community because they have been there for a very long time. Open source started before even Mosaic or HTTP were there. Like in the eighties, they were, and then and and then original internet was intended to be. Decentralized, so when the bomb destroy one, we would still have connectivity from the others, and from that come from, you know, standards, interoperability, persistency, a lot of those concepts that we're talking about in metaverse and in、uh, Web three 
has come from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s development. We are standing on the shoulder of giants. And I think to, I feel like the, the metaverse actually has a bit more coherence, like more people getting to your standard, like with the crypto, I feel they are even more insulated. And I, and I don't see those two community works very closely with the open source community. I think that that cross learning can be very beneficial. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very good point on, on open source. We see a lot of open source in the visual effects industry, and I think it has created a, a trust amongst a certain number of people. And now what, what I feel we need to see is like expand the circle of trust and reached out to a new generation of people that come from more the Web3 side of the world and create create those human relationships. And this is also one of the reasons I think the principle in some way is better than rules. Um, because open, we can learn something from open source of the principle. Not necessarily all commercial company will be open source, but there are certain principles that works, like what you said, human connections, trust, transparency. Yeah, thank you. I think it's spot on. So I have to ask about Terminator 2 because it was such an important and pioneering movie for visual effects. So can you tell us how you got involved into this project? Yeah, I was really lucky, actually. Um, so when I when I came to NCSA, it was at the very beginning of um, Jim Clark started the Renaissance Experimental Lab. And so we have actually not only a supercomputer, but we also have the largest number of the most powerful silicon graphics machine in our um, in Beckman Institute. And then we also have a software group that was doing like interoperability, making silicon graphics, Unix, um, Mac, PC all work together. Um, there's a project called Collage. People didn't know that was before Mosaic, uh, which is all about interoperability of different machines and networked computers. Um, so when, when, when they were doing Terminator 2, they were pushing envelope of everything in computer graphics, right? And back then, if you try to render something in that quality, you need to use supercomputer. You can't just use desktop or one desktop computer. We were the only one who have networked uh, silicon graphics machines and supercomputers to, to do that. So I was involved on two aspects. One is to take the scan data. They scan the head of T1000 and also Arnold, and they need to make it very realistic looking. And I had the software at NCSA at that time already. It's called Alpha Shape, which takes a point cloud and turn them into shapes. And that's Alpha Shape was the beginning of Geomagic, actually. So at, at NCSA, I was I was doing that. And my ex-husband, Herbert Adelsboner, was a very um, well-known uh, geome uh, geometer. So he does computational geometry. I learned much of my math from listening to, to him and his colleagues. And so that's how I got into try to solve some difficult problem, like scanning back then was state of art. Um, the second one that I got involved was um, the piece where the T1000 melt down to a puddle. That's a quite long sequence. And some of our people with the industrial light magic people was using wavefront and pulling control points. And no matter what they do, it didn't look like a metal. It just kept sticking out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so by the time that it wasn't approved by Jim, Cameron, we were kind of late and, and I, we were working day and night. And one day my uh, Herbert asked me, what are you worried about? Or, you know, what, what, what's going on? Why are you not coming home? And I told him the problem. He said, oh, he said, I can write you a morphing uh, algorithm because he's a mathematician. Um, I said, morphing, what's that? He says, you know, if I take a fourth dimensional object, every cross section should be a legal three-dimensional object. So you can take the person and, and end up the puddle, and then you create this fourth dimensional object, and then your timeline is the is the is the cross section, and that's the every cross section is is a 3D object. I don't really understand it. I can only visualize <laughs> it. I you know, he writes the formula and we go 
write the s- software, and then we did a plugin into um, into Wavefront. So then that started to work um, quite well. So we actually filed a morphing pattern, but we were doing the 4D to 3D morphing. So at the end, that algorithm using the supercomputer and silicon graphic rendering was a saving the the movie because <laughs> that was the the key piece in that movie to make yeah, it absolutely you know, as a breakthrough. So those, I remember those seeing that good. movie it was it was a shock. There was so much um, work and also so much of um, just fixing a lot of Photoshop <laughs> when, <laughs> when you see something not working, and then also mix mixture of the real special effect with the with the CG, and that was really a breakthrough. Even though it felt very experimental, and at that time Industrial Light Magic was very small, like eight people, um, and and then the the mainstream adoption comes five years later when Jurassic Park yep. was using a lot of CG, but that's actually the beginning of the CG that every everybody remembers. Yeah, it's so cool to hear that story. Uh, the CG in Terminator Two was it was the talk of my neighborhood. I mean, we'd be at the basketball court and we'd be talking about that exact morphing scene. Um, but yeah. you also mentioned Geomagic, uh, so I wanted to go back and, and maybe talk a little bit more about that. So, so you started it in '97, I believe. The inspiration came when you bumped into Chuck Hall, uh, co-founder of 3D Systems, which later acquired Geomagic, and you saw him with an SLA machine. Um, so, as part of this work, I mean, you created the first bi-directional bridge between the real and virtual world using 3D scanning and 3D printing. Really, an early version of digital twins today. So we'd love to hear more about the story and, and the vision for, for Geomagic. Yeah, that was interesting because after Netscape went public, university went crazy going like, what's the next killer app? And they go like, ping, everything you touch seemed to turn into gold. I'm like, no. <laughs> um, and at that time also, the, the, the market was so crazy. Everybody's calling themselves dot-com company. If you remember, uh, sound was uh, we are the dot dot com and GE goes destroy yourself dot com right <laughs> everything was dot com and I thought well you know you you just because we invented inter- uh, like something got invented in the internet and got widely adopted it doesn't mean everybody's dot com company makes no sense so I didn't want to start a dot com company at the time so I'm one of those person who doesn't quite follow the trends. Um, and then I met Chuck Hall, and I was really surprised that you could actually print something from a machine. Given my uh, upbringing, that I worked in the factory a lot, that I, I, I ran milling machines by hand. Uh, so I asked him, I said, what is your biggest challenge? He says, software. The fact that he could actually print the parts out of that machine without software was amazing. Because back then, the CAD software exists, but CAD software like AutoCAD was sketching uh, or um, early some soft, uh, cats of uh, parametric, whereas the 3D printing is all discrete. It's points to points. So, so things I was working on scanning and points of a shape. So it, it was very natural for me to think, oh, I can create a software for 3D um, printing. And then I looked at the CAD software. I couldn't connect to the CAD software because CAD software are algebraic geometry and I was doing the discrete geometry. So I looked out and saw, you know, what else out there? And then I saw all the, th- all the 3D cameras and they ca- captured the data, have no place to go. They got a whole bunch of points. I thought, oh, I can connect those two. Just like Adobe connected the optical recognition, you know, over to digital desktop publishing. So I'm just... Naively, I think I'm just doing a dimension higher. Um, didn't anticipate how hard that was. And that, that was the beginning. And I actually, when I started a company, I went to raise money. And I was imagining a microwave o- oven. So I, my presentation was imagine that you, um, you can walk into Nike town and you put your feet on this 3D scanner and you dial a number and then it goes to the manufacturing side, and they dial the number, and then they'll print the part out. So it's like a 3D fax machine. And 
and I was thinking of the microwave environment has a turntable in there, so you can you can uh, 3D scan it, and then you take that part out, you put something else in, you push a button, you can print it. I was just imagining it, that nothing existed. But the venture capital at the time really liked it, and I, I raised the money just to give one talk. Um, but that was also at the internet high, and that's how I got company started. That's like the most successful fundraising story I've ever heard. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> so, Ping, if, I mean, if you look back 20, 25 years later on your, ambi your ambition for helping folks create personal factories, I mean, are you happy with the progress? It's always slower than I thought, you know, because I'm always on the bleeding edge of technology. I work until I become cutting edge, and then I lose interest, and then I go to the bleeding edge again. Um, but um, what helped me was when I was advised Obama on innovation, I asked to see um, some like macro data on innovation. And the, the, the average company that takes an invention, not innov innovation, you can take other invention and put together, come with a new way. But from an invention to being adoption, at the beginning of adoption of a mass market, on average is 28 years. So that made me feel like we hear all this um, uh, social media, all this company become billion dollars company in five years, whatever, whatever, right? And many of those companies are not really innovators. They are, they are putting something that's already there and it's more business model, more other things. But if you talk about fundamental technology to market ad adoption, it's about 28 years on average. So, so from that perspective, I'm not totally not happy with the progress. Gotcha. Yeah, an interesting mm -hmm. stat. So, I mean, what about if you look at different segments, like, for example, the consumer side with things like fashion or, or art? How do you feel the adoption has been for, for those? Well, fashion industry is probably one of the most difficult industry. Very few companies can make it, and then people don't know like the Italian fashion is so successful it's because they were a community and they from very early on they got together to do advertisement together so they found the area where they don't compete right and then they do it together that's why you know all the fashion magazine you you see all different brands in there but they all pull their money together so they can spend less money and then have more impact um, and because it was deemed uh, too utilitarian to have patent or intellectual property protection, so you can copy anybody's work, um, it drives innovation. You have to innovate, otherwise you, you can't succeed. Or you can copy, but even if you copy, you have to make something on your own. Um, I find them adopt technology rather early. Like 3D scanning was very early on, adopted by fashion industry. 3D printing, same thing. And you can go there and test out all kinds of technology and they, they will do the most crazy thing. Um, and that's why I like to uh, use them as a, as a test bit. The other thing I wanted to differentiate is a style and the fashion. So an artist or a designer, um, they, have, they all have their style. When, when you talk about style, it is it's individual's contribution. It's his imagination, his taste, his design, uh, or her, you know, his or hers. Uh, but when it becomes a fashion, it means a community who adopt to a concept that's been created. So um, if you write a book, you don't care about anybody who reads it. Now, when I write a book, just write a diary, right? If you care about who reads it, you care about your community or the... the um, so fashion is an industry where they have to care about the consumer because it's not about the style. It's about the community adopting to that style. And it's also about uh, recognize that talent, right? Uh, so in some ways, it's similar to music. You have to recognize the talent. But in some ways, you also don't really know what people like. So it's a really good test ground. Yeah, I really like that community perspective. Um, with fashion, you mentioned the 3D printing, and uh, that's a perfect segue because I did have a question I wanted to ask you. If there were some 
innovations there around 3D printing and fashion that you're hoping to see come into the metaverse? When I was doing technology and fashion, my interest was more of testing the technology and helping the artists to achieve something that they could never do before. And then, and for example, like uh, Aris van Harpen's design, which is very out there, um, but it's not really wearable. So another project that I did was with um, Issa Miyagi's origami folding. And what's interesting there is you have to mathematically compute the folding patterns, and then they do the fashion, and then you come back, re, um, readjust based on the design, and I still need to be origami affordable. And so that iteration to me was quite interesting. And then you can use 3D printer to actually create a high temperature crease just for testing. Like in the real world, you don't use 3D printer to do that, but 3D printer, you can do it right away. And uh, you can, and then you can test it to see if it works. And, and that type of innovation is really interesting. Like I really love the origami fashion series because it's so easy to travel. It does not wrinkle, it pack flat, it lift up, it's got, you know, sculpture, like um, you can wear it anywhere. You can just put it outside of your t-shirts and jeans and suddenly you can you can go to your dinner. I, the, the functionality and the, the beauty and then also the packability, like I love that. Um, now, when you ask for metaverse, a lot of people think about you know, you can sell fashion in the metaverse. And I'm more thinking of the fashion and metaverse, like digital fashion, could could that be the key to help us to reduce the fast fashion? Because fast fashion is an environmental polluter, right? Of course, you will still have really good fashion, very good craftsmanship you want to keep forever. But fast fashion, if people just want to express themselves, why not go to the metaverse and put your digital fashion on you? You can do all kinds of variety. You can do it way better than, you know, some of the cheap fast fashion try to sell to you. And, and you can create your own and it's not as expensive and no waste. I think that would be a very interesting area in terms of fashion. It's really about self-expression, but it can be a great environmental contribution. You know, I do believe that the metaverse will become a primary way of self-expression and hopefully it gets better results than current social media. But I think it's looking at it as having implication in real life and for fast fashion is very, very interesting. So, yeah. Um, so you've said that what really interests you, you know, you're both, a, you know, an artist and, and, a, and a scientist. You said that what really interests you is the space between art and science, and in particular, taking the artifacts of our history and moving them to the future. Can, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, what's interest? So, so I'm I'm kind of an in between person. I grew up in China. I come to the United States. The two country, two big country, from ideology point of view, could not be more different. But I benefit from learning from two extreme and then operating in the middle. <laughs> and the art and, and science, science has the similar feeling. Uh, in, in everything that I or the team trying to create, I'm always thinking about how can we differentiate measurable from immeasurable, right? So the art is the immeasurable, the science is the measurable. If you cannot falsify something, then it's not the science. But with art, you cannot falsify almost anything. And then, and then you you can also think of science is more the brain, and the art is more the heart. So how do you how do you combine them? And and that that's that's just fascinates me. Um, how do you express science and engineering in a way that touches people's heart? And we know that people don't remember what you say, but they remember how you make them feel. How can we make something technical feelable, right? Um, so that's that. From that sense, I I like art. I don't like art just for the sake of art. I like how art expands our senses beyond language, beyond formulas. But I like science in its rigorousness. You know, there is something about when you can really put it into a formula 
which you can repeat them, <laughs> or um, if you can prove something is true or false, and there's something really grounding for me <laughs> there, um, but it didn't feel enough. So the art gives me all these other wings to um, take the science to other places. Interesting. So you're on the board of Burning Man. Mm -hmm. And I think you, I've heard you describe Burning Man as an experiment, experimental city where you can reimagine and recreate civilization. Mm -hmm. So how important are virtual and digital experiments for Burning Man? Because you think that you know, the virtual would be a great space to reimagine civilization. So that's a, a good question. So we actually created a virtual Burning Man during the COVID because we couldn't have Burning Man. So Burning Man is interesting because somebody said Burning Man to entrepreneurs is like golf course to the bankers. If you go to Burning Man, you find all Silicon Valley entrepreneur all there, right? And of course, there's many others, the makers, the artists, the photographers, you name it, the performers, they're all there. But but all the entrepreneurs are also there. Um, so, which means that when we wanted to create a virtual um, Burning Man, there's all the volunteers. We, we got all the talents there. So we had the BIC VR. We had a several like uh, virtual Burning Man. Um, the attendee to just BLC VR itself has a three times more people show up to the virtual space compared to the actual event, which is 70,000 people max. Right? We had 200,000 people coming into the virtual space. Um, so, so that shows that it didn't matter it's a virtual or physical. Of course, they are different. But what is important is the connection that people feel in there, the creativity, the self-expression. There's a lot of things missing in the actual Burning Man that we can, can feel, connect. But there's also a lot of things that we could do in the virtual space that we cannot do in the physical space. They're not the same, um, but they're equally important. And I think in the future, we will not, like, I've been working in this digital, physical, phys physical to digital forever, right? But I think when the metaverse really is there, is the day that we no longer differentiate the digital and physical. Like today, we don't talk about desktop publishing anymore. When we publish, whether or not we publish onto a digital format or we publish into a print format, they both are publishing. We no longer say we are publishing in digital or we're publishing in print, right? We don't say that anymore. We just publish. I think a metaverse, of course, is harder. It would take longer for us to get there. It would be some area will come earlier. I mean, the gamers have been there for a long, long time. You know, I've been doing 3D scanning, 3D printing for a long time, but we're really talking about everyone can experience it. If I were to look at Web one, that's all about sharing information. I look at web two, it's all about sharing resources. That's where the Ubers, the you know, Airbnbs and the social media comes in. And when I look at web three and the metaverse, it's all about sharing experience. Our life is experience. Experience creates memories. You know, it's it's not it's really not about whether or not it's gonna happen, it's a one, it's gonna happen. It's already happening. And the metaverse is a living, breathing world that we live in and ex expands our human capacity. We human has been so good in always creating tools that expands our physical limitation. Like if we can fly, we build airplanes. Our hand is not strong enough, we build tools, right? For, for millennials, we build tools. Now is the only time, like this century, our lifetime, is the beginning of we're expanding our mental self. So suddenly we're not just expanding our physical self. And then metaverse is where we can expand our mental self. And that's super exciting. Absolutely. And actually you're, you're part of another adventure. You know, Live Nation is the leading live entertainment company um, in the US, if not in the world. And what, how do you see, I mean, as a director, and of course we want scoops if you have scoops, but otherwise directionally, how does a company like Live Nation see the future of entertainment on, online and right. in the metaverse? Well, metaverse would be very important to Live Nation for the future 
And we, during the COVID, we already did some limited experiments on that. If you think about sports, right? Like uh, people go to big arenas to watch sports, but then the then generally people will come to somebody's home or go to the bar. They're watching the sports together. It's a social, it's a social event that all happens in the physical space. In the future, if if my favorite artist is playing in uh, in Spain, I can't get there. In metaverse, I can get a frontline seat at my house watching the show at the same time. So Live Nation is not going to be the uh, recording and replay kind of company. It's always going to be the live entertainment company. But that live entertainment company does not have to be limited to the location and, and, and um, number of people or, or, or the arena, right? Metaverse would be the extension to that. So that that's like the quantum space. We can be there and here at the same time. Here is everywhere. And that's what Metaverse can offer. And I think it would be a huge breakthrough because human breakthrough always come from technology that alters our perception of space and time. And the metaverse would completely alter that immediacy of space and time and, and enable us to be quantum, which, you know, most people still say, you know, how can you be here and there at the same time? If you're in metaverse, <laughs> you can be there and here at the same time. And if you look at the physics, when physics had a huge breakthrough is when the time domain and space domain can interchange freely. Before that happened, you know, it was very, very um, isolated in different domain. And once that happens, electronics, like there's so much invention happens. So I think like metaverse is, is that time and space is um, no longer have a distance. I think you have a very inspiring view on the metaverse. Um, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk a bit about leadership and diversity. Um, so, you know, you're active promoting entrepreneurship and women in, in mathematics and sciences. Uh, you're on numerous foundations, uh, National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, uh, National Council on Women in Technology. I mean, this is really important work. Could you tell us more about it? Yeah, actually, this started um, with a story when my daughter was 13 and she came home and she said, um, Mom, I don't really want to be that good with math. I said, why? She's really good with math. <laughs> I said, why? She says, it's not cool. If you're good with math, it's not cool. And I was thinking like, okay, she's a girl and, you know, it's middle school. Um, being smart is not cool. And I said, can I come to your school and give a talk? And she looks at me, she said, mom, if they don't want to be you, uh, it doesn't really matter what you say. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, I said, but I'm taken. They can't be me. They have to be themselves, you know. Um, but it was then I start to think about promoting, um, promoting women in science and technology. It's not just about... Um, positioning, it's its not about those. It's about the being, it's about the person. And Warren Buffett, um, Warren Bennett has a book called The Becoming Leader. And in there, he said the leadership is a being, being the person, not the position. And, and so promoting women in science and technology and in um, leadership to me is, is to build that wholesome person, right? That 360 person. I think a woman has a lot to offer, just like a man has a lot to offer. We all work together. And uh, and I think a younger generation started to have non-binary and no genders and, you know, very fluid. Fine, doesn't really matter. But at the end, it's the being. It's it's who you are. And I, would, I always tell women like, hey, at home, you are the boss, you know, like your husband, your children, they all listen to you you are already the leader because you cannot be a leader if no one follows you. <laughs> um, your manager, you know, you can demand. <laughs> um, but it's, um, I think 21st century, um, we, have, we have increased so much of consciousness and there's more gender, gender equality. 
And and I'm not thinking of equality in terms of 50-50. I come from Asian. It's like all in and yang, you know, be woman, however you want to be, and you can you can be leader. So I more coming from educating women from the soft side because I think the skill set they already have. Most of the girls are better in math in, in high school than the boys. I don't need to teach them to be better in math. I need to teach them relevancy and I need to teach them um, love themselves, build curiosity, build confidence. And that's where I, you know, get very active in. It's a half the population. So when you, when you joined 3D System after the acquisition, your title was Chief Entrepreneur Officer. Yeah. Did you come up with that title? No, I started as a chief entrepreneur, uh, chief strategy officer when I first joined the company. And then Avi started buying a lot of company and he wanted me to uh, in- incorporate the company into 3D systems. And then he basically said, I'm the father, you're the mother, and um, let's do this together. And then he actually come up with that title. He called me chief entrepreneur officer so that I can go work with all the entrepreneur company that he acquired. And, um, but it's such a long name. So people keep calling me CEO. <laughs> like, no, I'm not the CEO. <laughs> I was the CEO. <laughs> he may have done that on purpose. I don't know, but he came up with that title. Yeah. Cultivating entrepreneur spirit, I think is very important and. I was glad to see this calling it out as a, as a title. So. Mm-hmm. And, and finally, you wrote a book, Band Did Not Break, which I actually recommend, uh, where you chronicle your upbringing in China and the Cultural Revolution. So you faced a lot of difficulties and you succeeded in, in a lot of ways. So what's, you know, as, as a closing thoughts, what, what are some of the lessons that resonate for you now more than ever? Yeah, so the the book is about resilience, and I think a resilience is something that's that's in this time, uh, especially with so many things goes wrong in the world. And I think it become an ever increasing important concept for for hu- hu- for humanity. But resilience is also a really great concept for engineering and design, um, because resilience design versus robust design. Uh, is a new concept. Resilience design knows things will not last forever, but it builds failure into the design as such. It fails the way you want it to fail. So the repair would be much easier. And then, then you can continue like the, the, the Bay Bridge. Um, new design was a resilience design and not all the, all the bridges are using those resilience design. So I think that concept applies to human, applies to design. That, that's one that I find very relevant today. There's some life lessons too, like one of the chapter title called Life is a Mountain Range. When I talk to young people, they always think about progress, their career or their personal development. They always think about up. In American, the peak is kind of the meta- mental metaphor that, we give to people. As such, when they go look for another job, they, they're not willing to take a job that's lower than the job before. And I like to change that ment- mental metaphor to a mountain range, because if you only go up, you go to one peak, you would see one view. You won't experience life fully. If you want to go to not- another peak, you have to go down. <laughs> you can't go up without going down, and going down is not a bad thing. So I think with that mental image, it would help a lot of people to think about their life and their career. Yeah, I really like that mountain range analogy. So Ping, we, we covered so many topics today. We talked about mosaic, geomagic, uh, Terminator 2 visual effects, fashion, Burning Man, diversity. We love to round out the episode. Um, if there's a shout out you'd like to give to a person or, or an organization. My shout out is Think about from doing to being. Because in the organization or in our daily life, we have to-do list, we have our calendar, we're doing, 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 doing. And busy is a choice. I hear a lot of people say, I'm too busy, I don't have a choice. Busy is a choice. But when you think about being, of course, doing is part of being. But it 
it expands your um, horizon, you know. And we are part of nature. We are part of each other. We're not just what we do. What we do is not only part of us. So try to um, yeah, company people um, think about that. Ping Fu, you're an innovator, an entrepreneur, and an artist. You've offered us some real fascinating insight today on, on your career and on the metaverse. So I want to thank you on behalf of everybody in our audience for being with us today. Thank you very much, Ping Fu. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Patrick. And a big thank you to our audiences as well. Hit up on social. Let us know what you want to hear about. Let us know what you think. Uh, Patrick, thank you very much. And thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you for the next show. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye.